Welcome, I'm Stephen Winnick of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. For many years, we've presented the Homegrown Concert Series featuring the best in folk music and dance from around the world at the Library of Congress in Washington. The challenges of the 2020 global pandemic taught us that online video concerts allow us to present a wider range of artists than presenting all our concerts in Washington. So now in 2023, we're presenting a mix of live concerts in Washington and pre-recorded video concerts from artists around the world. And we are very excited to be able to present one of my favorite groups, Deitch, who play traditional folk music from Germany with modern arrangements. When we can, we like to do interviews with our homegrown artists. So I am here with Gudrun Walter and Jürgen Trace of Deitch. So welcome and thank you both for this interview. Hi. Hello. So could you begin by saying your own names for us so that people will know how they're really pronounced and not, <laughs> not how I pronounce them? It was not that bad. So my name, <laughs> my name is Jürgen Treitz. And my name is Gudrun Walter. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you some questions about your, your own background. So beginning with Gudrun, I understand that you come from a family of folk musicians that's international in scope. So can you tell us a little bit about that background? So um, as far as I know, my great grandfather started it. He was a fiddle player. He played for dances. So he would have played a lot of the repertoire that we are playing or similar tunes. Um, for dancing in the village or the surrounding villages. He walked to his gigs and played, and he was paid in wine and potatoes, I hear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess the following generations just took it from there. So um, both my uh, parents also played fiddle. Um, my great granddad on the other side of the family played the diatonic accordion, so nothing is new. And um, my brother uh, started to play Irish music when he was 17, and he is 12 years older than me. So I was immersed in Celtic music from a very young age. But also I got all the German folk songs from my mom's side. Um, she was singing to me in the evening. So that's how I grew up. Excellent. And, um, and Jürgen, how about you? What was your background like? Was there music there as well? Yes, there was. Not so much in the family, but I had... Uh... Um, the, uh, I started with a recorder, that's um, uh, an instrument everybody has to learn in Germany, right. or at least it was uh, 30, 40 years back. Then I moved on to the piano, got classical lessons for seven years. But then uh, when I grew 14, uh, classical piano did not seem to be that cool anymore, so I picked up the guitar electric in the first place and played a lot of rock and roll blues so stuff like that um, but also uh, a love for the acoustic guitar came up uh, immediately and that was kind of um, fueled by a, a very young teacher that i had he was not a music teacher um, he was in our school and uh, taught our class german and politics and stuff but he was a big folk lover uh, and he kind of introduced me. Uh, before that, I, I had known like American folk, Bob Dylan and British folk and, and stuff like that, but not so much the traditional folk music. And that guy, Uli is his name, uh, he introduced me to traditional dance music from several regions in Germany, from France, uh, also from Germany. And he... Uh, he also uh, made me aware of instruments like bagpipes or hurdy-gurdies and that that so it was all for most of the time it was two sides of the coin i did electric music rock music but i also was very much interested in those acoustic uh, sound shapes and bits right well you mentioned that everyone must learn recorder as part of normal education in Germany. So could you tell us a little bit about music education as you know, how, how kids are, are, uh, you know, taught music at first? I mean, um, the recorder that was actually in school in, in, in the first two years of school, um, you, um, had, you got some basic musical education and that, uh, was, um, uh, the instrument of choice was uh, a recorder because it's cheap, I, I guess. 
but then uh, taking it from there, all the all the kids uh, were encouraged to pick up. Uh, no, may I say a proper instrument? <laughs> I don't want to say something. <laughs> Dangerous, dangerous. <laughs> right. And our music teacher would uh, show us different instruments, and and that's where I I went for the piano. Uh, probably because we had a piano at home. My mom also played classical piano when she was younger, so that was the obvious choice. But to answer your question in the general way, I think you wanted to know like how music is taught in generally in in German schools. Uh, and um, I think starting with the recorder is still done in some schools, but not as much probably as it was when we were young. Um, I think nowadays um, teachers also use like digital um, like recordings to sing along to or to dance along to. And actually Jürgen in his studio where we're sitting right now is producing a lot of music for our schools to like, you know, sound examples. That this is how Latin music sounds and all that. Mm -hmm. so it's quite interesting. I think uh, a lot of, of music teaching in schools has changed from the time when we knew it to how it's done these days. And I think a lot of interesting things have de developed in the last few years. Sadly, uh, we have to say, and it's probably the same uh, over your way, during the pandemic, because of the digital um, lessons, you know, the remote teaching, yeah. lots of things um, couldn't be done like they were supposed to be done. And now lots of teachers are missing. So I think from what I hear from lots of my pals who have young children is lots of the music lessons are actually not uh, taking place at the moment, but we hope that there's a way forward because it's so important to have like music in, in, a, in your life when you're very young. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I wonder in Germany whether uh, traditional German folk songs and music are part of that education when kids are in school. Not so much. I mean, when I was young, it was strictly classical. You were mm -hmm. uh, you were taught the the odd Volkslied, which is our word for a traditional folk song. You would learn some of them in school, in primary school, uh, but um, then it's all it was all concentrated on classical music. And nowadays, um, uh, contemporary music like pop, rock, Latin blues, jazz, that's also, uh, that gets more and more incorporated, but not so much traditional music in Germany. Sadly not. But, you know, some some kindergartens actually use folk songs to sing along to. And I think it, it should be widely encouraged to do it because that, that's how I grew up and they're brilliant, you know, they're, they're right. everything there, you know. <laughs> Great stories, lovely songs, catchy tunes, why not? I mean, you know. <laughs> so Very much, yeah. Yeah. W wonderful. So, so you know, you mentioned Gudrun that um, when you were uh, young, your older brother was involved in in Irish music, and so I've been a music journalist for a long time, and I I used to interview a lot of groups from Europe, like in the '90s, and I would talk to you know Varsina from Helsinki, and they would say, well, you know, it was Helsinki in the 1970s, so everyone was playing Irish music, and then I would talk to La Muscania from Spain, and they would say, you know, it was Madrid in the 1970s, so everyone was playing Irish music. So. It, was that also true in Germany? Was the Celtic music wave a, a big part of people getting involved in traditional music? Absolutely. And I mean, the reason why I'm sitting here now in this profession is because I saw touring bands from Ireland and Scotland um, in the, not the 70s, because that's when I was born, but like yeah. maybe <laughs> late 80s, beginning of the 90s, that was the, the time when I saw like the Battlefield Band and, um, you know, uh, Planksty, you know, other bands that from that era who were touring in Germany um, as part of the big folk festivals, the Irish folk festival, the Scottish folk festival, and I was completely blown away. And everybody tried to play those tunes, you know, and everybody was really into that music. So I think they did a lot of groundbreaking work in, um, for me, as um, I can only speak for me, but that attracted me to that kind of music. And then I wanted to know what the music of my own home country sounds like if you treat it in a modern way so right and i as i said i've seen that trajectory in people from a lot of other countries um was that true of you as well jürgen or were you more really involved in rock and roll at that in that period no it's absolutely true you you could hardly avoid uh, to come across irish bands because they yeah there was a, a lot of 
gigs going on, tours going on, concerts going on. So, yeah, and it was good. All right. So yeah. w w w one other influence that I think is very interesting in, in Germany that may be more prevalent there than in some other countries that I know of in Europe, um, and this is how I first came to know about you guys, was that I got interested in a group that Jürgen was in um, called Adaro, which is a me was a medieval uh, rock band, right? So medieval music. So there's a sort of connection between the folk scene and the medieval music scene in Germany. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of interest for medieval music in Germany. I think it started in the 90s, probably. Um, there are a lot of medi like medieval fairs um, all over the country. And certain, certainly there would be music, there would be bands uh, uh, playing. And I mean, strictly speaking, in the origin, it, it was just traditional music just older traditional music yeah. with its root in the roots in the Middle Ages, not like the most of the repertoire that we are playing with Deutsch is maybe only 200 or 250 years old. Um, the instrumental in the, music. The instrumentals, yeah. Songs are. Songs are a bit older. older. Um, so there is a bit uh, a big market for that um, archaic sounding medieval music. And then in the 90s, uh, uh, there was a big wave of bands kind of um, putting together this medieval, um, the medieval instruments and the medieval tunes mit, with uh, rock and roll or even metal, hard rocky um, um, band contexts. And there are bands that got really famous. They are really big stars over here. Um, and that wave is still going. I think it's it's over, might be over the over the peak, but um, there's still a, a lot of that music around. And for some people, um, that would be the first time they would see a hurdy-gurdy or some bagpipes, you know, on a, on a stage in one of those uh, concert hall they're playing halls like big halls these days those bands but also yeah. on people fairs some people would that's the first time they see an instrument like that and then maybe some people get attracted to folk music where they like see that used in a different context but the same kind of instrument so i think that's a link there as well like not only the repertoire but also the instruments yeah so similar to what you mentioned with irish music that people see those fiddles and and Irish bagpipes and they say hey there's a German equivalent and with the medieval stuff it's you know there's a more modern equivalent to all of that so yeah thank you for explaining that for us um so your instruments in the group um Gudrun primarily uh you mentioned fiddle and diatonic accordion so yeah. those are pretty common on the German folk scene yes I would say so yeah Nothing special. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> right, but <laughs> the only thing maybe that's special is the tuning of my box because it, so it's a diatonic instrument, but it it uh, it's a hybrid between two systems. So there's the Irish system, which is like semitones. So right. you have C sharp D or the B B C uh, tuning, and then the French system would be in in fourths. So you have D G or C F or you know one of those, and mine is C sharp D G. So that's a combination of two systems, which comes in very I handy. I can play both Irish music and um, more continental European music. And I can also do song backing with the left hand. So it's it's quite it's quite good, I think. <laughs> that actually is, is really interesting. And it's not something that you would necessarily notice just seeing you play a couple of tunes on it. But um, that makes a lot of sense. So just to mention for the audience, so the the advantage of the Irish system, the semitone half step system is that you end up with a chromatic run. You can play all the all the half tones and that's important for some of those Irish tunes. Um, and you can't really do that on the boxes that are tuned in fourths. So you have one set that's a half step apart from another set and then the, your third row is a fourth away. That's really interesting. So thanks for explaining that. That's that's great. Um, and then Jürgen, you're the guitarist, and um, you know, guitar, of course, is a fairly recent introduction to a lot of the um, 
the European folk musics. So explain how, you know, the methods of playing the guitar, which were developed for other music, you know, are, are so helpful in, uh, in German folk music as well. Yeah, I mean, what, what I'm playing is kind of a, a mixed bag, uh, things that I, I've picked up uh, from different genres of music. First, again, the Irish tradition uh, of, you call that backing a tune, so the accompaniment of a tune. Um, and also the uh, in Irish music, uh, the open tunings are quite common. Most of all, that gut tuning, that's just the notes of the strings, D, A, D, G, A, D, and that's the tuning I, um, I play um, most of the time, at least. Um, so that gives you a kind of a fuller sound and uh, uh, you have uh, you can leave lots of open strings ringing through which colors all the the chords so that they are not just standard major or minor chords but right. there would also always be some extensions coming through the open strings so that's a, a sound i i always love and which i try to incorporate into the german tunes as well so that would be one one thing. And on the other hand, I after school I studied jazz guitar, electric. Um, so that also, um, uh, yeah, made me aware of lots of advanced chords. I, I'd say, which are not traditional in 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 our type of music. And I can squeeze the odd one of those cards or <laughs> alterations in. <laughs> right. And the rest right. of us, what? Excuse me, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, you went to the the Munich Guitar Institute, is that right? Because yeah. that, that's quite a well-known uh, school for guitar in Germany. So yeah. So yeah, I think it, it was um, made up after um, after the uh, Guitar Institute of Technology in Los Angeles. I think two students who studied there in the U.S. Uh, just copied the concept and brought it over to Germany in the and the 70s, uh, I think, and it's been very successful um, ever since. At, at that time in the 70s, um, there were only two universities all over Germany where you could uh, study jazz music. It was only Hamburg and. Cologne, I think. Cologne, yeah. Um, um, all the rest was only only classical. That has changed a lot. Now you can uh, study not only jazz but also pop music and everything. Uh, not traditional music though. Yeah. Uh, but back then, uh, the this uh, Münchner Gitarren Institute was just one of the few possibilities where you could uh, study other than classical guitar, other styles than classical guitar. So you just mentioned that you can't study traditional music at, at university, which is now becoming fairly common in countries like England and Ireland. They have programs in uh, universities. Do you think that might be on the horizon in Germany for someone yeah. to introduce that? We are certainly working towards it. Um, so one of our projects that we're just launching is uh, for next year, there's a really big world music and folk festival in Germany called Rudolstadt Festival. It's in the former east of Germany. Mm -hmm. And um, they, together with us, um, are working on a youth orchestra project that we will lead next year. Where we will work with um, about 40 um, young people between 12 and 23. And we would want to present that on a, like a, a big stage and with television broadcasting and all that and it, it will be a, a rehearsal camp before the festival and then mm -hmm. a presentation concert and we got funding for that so like that's one of the projects where i hope like it will generate um some you know exposure for our kind of music and to for it to be taken more seriously and we're working with the institutions that also run the the national youth classical orchestras and so they're um, putting it out, they put it in their newsletter, they're advertising for the youth folk orchestra. So we're trying to like slowly but surely work hmm. towards uh, recognition of the music and then appreciation of the music. And then hopefully when it's taken more seriously, then maybe you will be able to study it in the future. Who knows? 
Yeah, I certainly hope so, because it, it's done wonders in, in other countries, of course. Um, Finland and, and Ireland, as I mentioned, these programs have, have helped a lot and, and really gotten uh, whole new generations uh, involved in the music. Yeah. So so let's talk about the formation of Deitch. I mean, I have some of the, I have the earliest recording, I think, so it was just a duo at that point. So how did you come together and start performing the kinds of music that you do in Deitch? Well, we, the first thing we founded together was Cara. That's our mm -hmm. Irish band, which um, toured also in the US, I think, eight times or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, with uh, Scottish and Irish members at the moment. And um, we founded Cara. And then while we were playing Celtic music, we also talked loads about like heritage and folk music in general. And then I think the two of us just got that notion of like, hey, why don't we try to make a record with just traditional German music. And then we did, I think Königskinder is the one you're referring to. Right, yeah. yes. That was the first one in 2005. And that was uh, a record where we mainly recorded songs. There's a few select tunes on it, but it's mainly songs that I knew from growing up and we found some in old books, but that was the first record. And then we did the second one in 2009, I think. But I, I just wanted to, yeah. to uh, add, that those were not um, duo albums. Um, we had a load. Uh, we had loads of guest musicians, mm -hmm. all kinds of instruments, uh, on both um, on both of the uh, first albums. But it was never like a fixed band. It was more yeah. like a project. We did gigs right. with copies. We even did gigs with drum and, and drums and and electric bass. On big festival, but it was not a constant lineup, so yeah. but it kept changing. And now with the actual release, Königskinder, I think we have finally with midsummer sessions. Uh, midsummer sessions, sorry, yeah. <laughs> find uh, and the lineup that you see in in the video. That's now a, a, a proper band, that's I would band, say. Yeah. yeah. And okay. how did that happen? How did you expand in that way? Well. Um, Stefan and Barbara are really good friends and have been for years. So what we do, like they also both play Irish music, but also mm -hmm. are very vers versatile in like different European traditions. And they are just uh, two people in a circle of friends that we regularly meet for sessions and just informal tunes and sing-alongs. And they are also um, two of the people that we all always spend New Year's Eve with every year. So oh, nice. it's like... We're here in the house and we're having a party and we're playing tunes through the early morning hours. So that's what we do. And um, so from playing sessions, really, we knew the two of them um, and we knew that we played really well together. And then we worked with both of them in different contexts with other bands. And then when we were thinking about recording the new album, we thought these two are actually the dream team for us to play with. And we tried mm -hmm. it and the first rehearsal was just, we didn't talk about music at all. We just played it and it was brilliant. And it was basically, even in the first rehearsal, it pretty much sounded like what you're hearing on the album. So that was amazing, just amazing. That is and amazing. That's always great when things click like that. Yeah. yeah. And I remember us uh, before that we were thinking, um, because we had released two Deutsch albums, we were uh, we have been thinking what would be good possibilities uh, lineup wise. What would be good instruments that make us, yeah, make it in interesting? Should we maybe work with drums and electric bass, or maybe with brass instruments? But in the end, nothing was so convincing. And then we we kind of thought, why aren't are we not just playing? With this music people. with our <laughs> with our people and favorite musicians and that was a good choice i think mm -hmm. well it certainly sounds um you know it sounds like you've been playing together forever you know it sounds like a very um polished and worked out uh band but also as you say they're just great musicians individually so tell us a little about them individually about um their you know their their music if you could do you want to talk about stefan and yeah. talk about barbara <laughs> uh, so stefan who plays the um the flutes and uh, the bagpipes um he plays a 
German uh, variation of the bagpipes, which is called um, Schäferpfeife, which would translate into shepherd's pipe. I think there are similar instruments in, in France, uh, in Belgium, even in England. Um, but that's one of the types of bagpipes that's uh, original in, in Germany that has been played a lot um, two, three, four hundred years back. Uh, but his first instrument is actually uh, the flute. He plays an Irish flute, so a wooden wooden flute. Um, and he not only plays them, he's also an instrument maker and he builds them. And I can say that he has quite a good reputation for his flute and he's selling them all over the globe. So he's kind of part-time musician, instrument maker. He's annoyingly talented. <laughs> in many in many fields. <laughs> yeah. So that, and, that's yeah. about Chevin. And he's from the northwest of Germany. I don't know if yeah. you have a like geography or so like yeah. Northwest close to the Netherlands from an mm -hmm. outsider's point of view. And Barbara is from the very south of Germany, from Bavaria. And she has a very traditional Bavarian background, which is in a way a little bit similar to my upbringing but even more traditional if you want because her parents were playing with all the siblings in a family band her dad is building traditional Bavarian bagpipes and hurdy-gurdies not professionally but like with a passion and they're really good instruments and um so barbara's first gig i think was played when she was eight that's when the family decided she was old enough to be on stage with the family band and they were playing for dances and traditional Bavarian music. So that was her upbringing. And then she, um, so she played fiddle and bagpipes as well. And then uh, she uh, took part in a workshop for Irish fiddle playing when she was, I think, 18 or 19. And guess who the teacher was? <laughs> and that's how we met. Because I thought, like, you know, it was a good workshop. I had, like, 15 students, and they were all quite good. But she was outstanding. You know, mm -hmm. she was, like, she not really played Irish music before, but she was laughing it up. Like, I, I would say something, and the next minute she would say, like that? <laughs> and do it. <laughs> I was like, oh, that Barbara, she's talented. And she was like, oh, I like her, she's nice. So we took to each other instantly and have been friends ever since. And then, yeah, and she like got on the on, on the fast lane because she learned about like all the Irish tunes that exist in the world in about a year and a half or something, like to the stage where sometimes she knows tunes that I don't know. So like, <laughs> I don't know why she did that, but she's also annoyingly talented. Well. I will say from from the perspective of our audience, I think all four of you are annoyingly talented, but but the music is not annoying. It, it's just beautiful. So we want to thank you uh, for for being here and and for the concert. Um, could you talk a little about your uh, your repertoire? Because I know so Gudrun, you mentioned that some of the uh, songs come from your childhood, that you learned them from your mother or your family. Yes. But also you mentioned manuscripts a lot for the for the tunes. So yeah. could you tell us where some of your repertoire comes from? I'll start with the songs and then I'll hand over to you to you for the tunes because um, the songs, like you say, partially I, I learned them just from the family tradition, but others are also from mm -hmm. like a lot of, um, we collect old song books, you know. So mm -hmm. some of them are um, even out of print and you can only get them in um, archives or, you know, bookstores for, for rare old books. And we have a tome, it's like a, three volumes and they're like this thick you could like kill someone with one of the, these books and they're um, a musicologist's uh, collection of or trying to be the complete collection of german folk songs and it starts like um in the 13th 14th century and then it goes all the way to romanticism and you know 19th century and that's like a um something where I got a lot of songs from or versions of songs from and it's great because you can com compare different versions of like you have a story about something and then you you're going to this book and you're looking up like 10 different versions with 10 right. different endings and you know it's really exciting so some of the big ballads that we sing we made up of different like bits and pieces of different versions that we glued together to a narrative that we really like so that's how we work with the songs excellent yep and for the 
traditional dance music for the tunes, um, there has been a, uh, a very interesting development uh, over the last 15 years because loads of those old manuscripts have shown up only recently. 20 years ago, it was really hard to find traditional tunes that were, may I say, that were any good. So that yeah. there, were, there were a couple and everybody knew them, but um, there was not much around, uh, even if you looked for them. But that has absolutely changed completely. Uh, and um, there have been some big collections that have showed up the most important i think is the tanzsammlung dahlhoff the dahlhoff music collection that was um that goes back to a family um over three generations by the name of dahlhoff and they were all employed by the church as organists and also as Küster, do you know that um escapes me now but the janitor of a church i don't know the, <laughs> the word <laughs> yeah um so um uh, they played the the organs in in the church, so they were um, educated musicians. They had studied music, classical music, but they also had uh, over three generations like a little wedding band, a dance band going on. And uh, since they were um, studied musicians, they could write down their repertoire, not uh, which is quite uncommon in traditional music because it's usually an oral tradition where tunes are passed on just from from you learn it from the playing of, of somebody else but the, this family Dalhoff, they have uh, kind of there, there was a, a, a th their music was found uh, under the roof in a in a little village in, in in a house in a little village in the münsterland and it contained uh, i think seven thick books with 900 melodies or something so quite a vast uh, like the o'neill's book of uh, for german <laughs> tradition <Right. laughs> and that that uh, that those books they were found and then they were digitalized and um, made available on the internet by the german um, staatsbibliothek uh, so that's also a, in, a, like a, li a national library yeah like us right <laughs> And um, that's just one example. Um, and, um, there were loads and loads of smaller yeah. tune collections that have been found, have um, been made available. Um, so the, the it's a completely different story if you look into traditional German dance music from hmm, there's hardly any 20 years ago. So now there's a, a huge world to explore. And mm -hmm. all is very, very new because they have just mm -hmm. recently it turned up so and it's getting more so like there's yeah. still collections selling. look i've just <laughs> oh that's great <laughs> <laughs> this is one, three volumes of my song bible <laughs> so, excellent <laughs> it's great and it's like i don't know if you can see it but it's like really old writing and right you know, some of the songs of melodies and some of the songs just have the lyrics and you can see like i mark i bookmark stuff that i want to investigate further so like this is work for uh, long winter nights <laughs> well i i definitely recognize that i have the same the same sort of system in my in, in at home it's in my basement right and i have all these song books and i you know put little post-its in it for <laughs> ones that i might want to learn someday so that's uh that's i think most singers would recognize that as a great fun. Uh, yeah. yeah so so much fun so yeah so that's great to see and you so now you've you've mentioned libraries and archives as uh an important source and of course we love that because we are the library of congress um and so so that's one thing that your national library has done to to help traditional music right there is to digitize those manuscripts are there are there also archives um of recordings of field recordings that the, the way we have at the library of congress not in that extent i think um which is very sad but i've um i've come across a few field recordings in smaller archives where um for example people traveled to pennsylvania where um mm -hmm. lots of people from my region in germany um um went to in the when was it in the 18 1840s 1850s i think mm -hmm. when like 
we had a couple of like really bad harvests and people were starving and really poor and they immigrated from the southwest of germany to pennsylvania and it's funny because when we toured america and we were driving through pennsylvania i really thought it looks like home and i mm. guess that's why they settled there because you know there's a similarity and so they took the songs with them and some people like musicologists traveled over and recorded old people singing old palatine that's the dialect i'm speaking yeah. palatine songs and I, I listened to some of those recordings and it's great like it's really funny and really really old songs that i didn't know like my granny would probably have known but i didn't so it was great very interesting that is wonderful. And I, I went to graduate school in Pennsylvania, and one of my professors was a Pennsylvania German folklorist oh, okay. named Don Yoder, who collected a lot of German language songs and spirituals and things like that in, in his community. So I'm familiar with some of those archival recordings on, on our side, and we have some of them in the Library of Congress, too. So you're welcome to come visit us, and we will play you our recordings of Pennsylvania Dutch oh, or Pennsylvania would, German music. I would totally love that. <laughs> yeah, <Thank> excellent. <laughs> so um, so let's talk a little about your approach to arrangement of these tunes, because you, you, so you start out with a book and it has the tune in it, but that's not exactly what you end up playing. So how do you uh, put that uh, onto your four instruments? Well, you see, that's what I meant when I said the first rehearsal with Barbara and Stefan was pretty much what you hear on the album like give and take some notes because it's not fixed arrangements it's just played like um in the moment and all of us just listen to each other and come up with like little counter lines and uh, chords and of course sometimes things can go south and it doesn't really sound nice but mostly it works well so what we did for this album midsummer sessions um which is the material that you hear in the online concert as well is we really didn't arrange a lot of things what we did arrange was the interludes of the songs, you know, so we have a structure to a song that's important, like you have a verse, chorus, interlude pattern that we follow. Mm -hmm. But for the tunes, for the instrumental music, we did really not arrange a lot. It's just spontaneous music making. <laughs> and that's, <clears throat> at least for me, that's quite unusual because I work as a music producer and arranger for various projects and I've uh, arranged music for a lot of CDs and other uh, recordings. But Deitch is actually a, a band that does not need an arranger. It's just, it's a typical folk band. We play together, we agree on a tune, but I would never tell Stefan, play that note, or Barbara, uh, please go down here or, or go up there, because they know what they're doing and they're, <clears throat> yeah. I think it's in the combination of instruments as well, because um, Jürgen, as the only guitarist, has a lot of liberty. It would be really different um, if there was a bass player as well. And yeah. it's really <laughs> different when I'm on the box, because then we have to agree on like at least like some chordal structure that we follow, so it doesn't completely clash. Um, right. Same goes for the two fiddles, because we do lots of harmonies. Um, so we have to be kind of in the same vibe as the guitar, which is not so hard, but then we have to agree with each other as well, like who's doing the melody, who's doing the harmony, but right. we would have a chat about that maybe, so we would play a tune, then we would stop, then we would go like, I really like what you did, and she would go like, I really like what you did, and then we would go like, okay, I'm low, you, you're top, is that okay? Yeah, fine, and that's it, that's the, that's the arranging chat we have, you know, so... <laughs> yeah, but you're also kind of always arranging in terms of, you know, listening to what the other is doing and making sure that you're all, you know, that your harmonies are all working. And, and of course, Jürgen has work to make the chords, the, the ones that support what's being played. So there's, it's sort of, it's not arranged, but it also has to be, uh, you have to be very present and, and arrange it as you're playing it. So it's I, an interesting. It's very important what you said, um, the listening is actually uh, more important than the playing because if you don't you don't listen closely to what the others do it can be very quickly very isolated you know where you end up but if you listen closely then it's actually it's a great experience to play like that and for me that's what trap music is about so that's why i really particularly love this band because it, it's uh, a great thing to have to to be in a room with four people and 
just play, you know. Right. That's how we recorded <laughs> the album as well. We sat in one room. There was no separation. There's no like tiny studio booths for each of us. Us, we were all in one room and um, and just played. And we did it during a heat wave, and it was terrible <laughs> because it was a small room and four people sweated a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are going through that now here. This well, you too, I'm sure. the the heat The global heat wave is uh is crazy. So, yeah, we understand, and uh, the the result was wonderful. At least we can say so. That <laughs> that's uh that that was a, a big success, despite the suffering that you had to go through. So, um, so great. Tell us a little bit about the video concert itself, the video that you produced for us. Where is that beautiful setting that you found for it? You, me. It's oh. it's quite quite nearby actually. It's maybe maybe ten miles from where the two of us live, mm -hmm. farther away from the others. Um, they live, yeah. Barbara lives uh, around Munich still, and Stefan still lives near Münster, which is five hundred kilometers from here, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, but when we talked about the video and you told us what you were expecting, uh, you said something like um, some... A sense of place. A, a setting that gives a sense of place. And when you said that or when we thought about that, it was, it was quite clear that uh, this museum where we actually went would be an ideal place. It's an... I don't know if you have something like that in the US too. It's a, a an outdoor museum mm -hmm. and they collect old houses that have not been standing there. The, mm -hmm. the old houses have been deconstructed, deconstructed uh, and rebuilt in on the museum ground. And they have, I don't know how many, 15, 20 houses yeah. are there, all different places like a carpenter's workshop, like a, a, a pub like uh, other other um the mayor's house and you know lots mm -hmm. of things and it's very beautiful uh, there and it's very very much nearby and since the the music that we are playing is roughly from the same time period and also roughly from the same region we thought it would be ideal to film there um and add some landscape shots in between mm -hmm. uh, of the surroundings um so so everything you see in the video pretty much is the area where both of us live so mm -hmm. all the landscape and and the houses would be traditionally uh, built so like that's the style of the old houses you see in even like in our village with the addition of new houses but in in the museum there's like old old all old houses and the one we played in was from 1820 something I think, and it was, it used to be a carpentry in the, like ground level is carpentry and then top floor was where the family lived and that's sure. where we went in their living room. <laughs> Wonderful. And, yeah, we, we, we do. Sorry, our sound engineer sat in the kitchen and uh, did the mixing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Actually, yeah. It worked out really well. I mean, the, the sound in the, in the video is great and um it it certainly looks like a traditional setting for uh for folk music so it worked great and you did a little bit of uh, performance outdoors as well which was nice so um yeah so tell us about that experience was it uh was it hard to arrange that the, the outdoor out part the outdoor part no that's actually in both settings both the outdoor part and the museum um the hardest bit was to fend off people who were like really curious about the recordings. Like, so in the museum, we had a sign outdoor that said video filming in progress. And it, instead of going, ah, there's a filming, I'll probably go away. People were like, oh, there's filming, I'm going to continue. You know? right. They opened the door and like, we had a number of takes where we had to like, okay, let's start again. <laughs> like a five-year-old running through the camera, you know. Right. <laughs> The, the meadow where we filmed is called the main meadow and the song we're singing is about the coming of may so that's why we thought yeah. let's film that outside and it's also it's a public spot and it's very very um popular with hikers and bikers and you know everybody so it was also quite a challenge to to be there in the center of it filming and playing instruments and people were like mm -hmm, you know? yeah. <laughs> so yeah but Apart from that, it was easy to do it. It's a, it's a lovely mm -hmm. spot. 
and that that outdoor filming that was not a, a recent uh, recently made uh, video uh, that was one of the videos we've done when we recorded the last CD mm -hmm. for with different hairs and right <laughs> <laughs> right but if if yes. anybody if anybody will wonder how how Stefan was able to grow his hair that much <laughs> within ten minutes, right? right. Our, our sharp-eyed viewers would would have picked up on that. Yes, so that's uh, it's good good to explain. But that yeah, but it, it works beautifully well within that context of the um, of the rest of the video. So yeah. it it really does look nice. So so great. How did you decide which of your repertoire which of your songs to put into this video oh well we we thought about well first thing was like we've done another uh, online concert for a festival that aired in also during the pandemic so we had a, a similar like a one take concert film that we we've done with material from the album and from our live gigs so we wanted to um play different tunes like not not the same set again we wanted to play some different tunes and then we also thought what would appeal maybe to an audience like your audience what what is interesting what can we play that um maybe from an outside perspective people go like oh that's you know check out german music so <laughs> i think that right. was the criteria that, you know both of that like not repeating ourselves too much and also like playing stuff that Sounds interesting, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we yep. a little bit more emphasis on the on the songs yeah. for that concert. I think on the album it's usually half and half songs versus instrumentals. And I think in the video we have a couple of more songs. Yeah. Wonderful. So so you had mentioned, you know, you might you might end up getting people uh, to explore more German traditional music so um are there groups that have influenced you or groups that you are peers with now who you recommend that people go listen to as well as you there are not too many uh bands uh, who are into german music one band would be um they're called bube dame könig so that's uh, like in a in a deck of cards uh, right. king queen and jack. and jack Uwe yeah. Dame Klinik, because it's a trio, two two guys, one one lady. They they are playing, yeah, not not only but mostly traditional songs. Yeah, singing. There, there is almost no instrumental music, but if you're into songs, she's got a beautiful soprano voice. So she, yeah, yeah, that's lovely. And then there's another band. They play a lot of instrumental music as well. Jürgen, it's a young band. Jürgen recorded their CD in his studio. They're called Fjord. Mm -hmm. F-I-O-R, they're quite good, like that's a, the next generation of musicians, <laughs> I, I would think that they would say that we've influenced them. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, yeah. All right, well, we will, we will look for that and, um, and maybe, you know, talk to them someday about doing a homegrown concert for us as well. But we, someday we would love to get you to come to Washington also, so we'll We'll keep talking and and as i said you'd be welcome to look at our collections at that time as well so is there any are there any questions that or any things that you would like to say that i didn't give you the opportunity that i didn't ask a question about anything you want to tell our audience about your music or german music or anything i can't really think of anything clever to say now <laughs> but um maybe just you know if they want to check it out um we have a website deitsch.de and they, if anyone has any questions, like where to find the online collections of like the transcriptions of the handwritten music, or um, if anyone has a question about songs or anything, just email us. We will reply in, in time, you know, but we're usually quite quick and we love people who are interested in, in the music and the background. So like if you have any questions or want to know anything, we're happy to help you find stuff. Well, thank you so much. I guess all, all that's left is to thank you once again, Gudrun Walter and Jürgen Treis. Was I was I closer this time? <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much. The band is Deitsch, um, and this uh, interview video will be posted on the Library of Congress website along with their concert video, which we really hope that you all enjoy. So thank you so much from the Library of Congress. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Steve.